Thank you, everybody, for joining us. I'm really honoured and excited um, to be able to speak with you. I just shared my slides a moment ago and when it did um, Zoom crash, so it was kind of perturbing. So I've, I just stopped for a moment, but I will reshare now. Hopefully you can all see the slides right now. We can. So it's, I see you're about to say something, James. Oh, yeah, no, I was just waiting to say that um, I can't see the slides. So I was just uh, reassuring you. That's all. Okay. Great. Okay, so we're, we're just, we're just, we're just start um, one minute, I think, just make sure that everyone has a, a, a good chance to join. Just to warn you, there's a little video at the start, and because it's Zoom, the quality of the video is not great, but just listen to the audio. The, the really crucial information is, is in what the children say rather than the video. Um, and I've tried optimizing it for Zoom, but that means that all sorts of other things don't work. So I've decided just to stick with good audio. Great. Thanks, Duncan. Well, it's now half past. So um, if you're ready, you can start. So um, the talk's entitled Transdiagnostic Approaches to Understanding Neurodevelopment. And I'm a cognitive neuroscientist by training. And in our lab, we're really interested in the broad heterogeneous population of young people who experience neurodevelopmental difficulties. And, and when we study the difficulties that they experience, we try and, and set to one side the diagnostic information that we know about them to try and, and focus more on the specific difficulties that they encounter. And that's because we suspect that some of the difficulties might be common across lots of different individuals, but also that the difficulties people have might not align neatly with particular diagnostic labels. And so people have sometimes referred to our work as being transdiagnostic. And so, before I start, I want you to meet some of the people that help us with our research. If I can get the slides to advance. Here we go. So these are the videos. The videos are really poor quality, but just listen to the audio. Stories get told off, and I just find it really, really hard to concentrate and do everything properly. And I just, yeah. English is like harder because in writing and um, reading, um, my reading's like not gone really well. And then my, uh, my writing has improved like a lot since I was in primary school. People with um, Okay, so Freddie, Billy and Eva have all helped us with our research. They've all been participants in the studies um, that we've been running. And let me tell you a little bit about each of them. So Freddie described himself as having difficulty paying attention. Teachers say that he can be fidgety and always on the go. He, at times he can be disruptive. He's had difficulties with maths and in primary school, he was given a diagnosis of ADHD. Billy also has difficulties paying attention. He's received support in lots of different lessons, really great provision at school. Also describes himself as being easily distracted. He experiences very high levels of anxiety. He has a therapy dog called Buster. And when he first took part in one of our studies, he had received no diagnosis at all. And Eva has difficulties reading. You can probably tell that she's also received a lot of support in speech and language. She also has experienced a lot of anxiety. So she describes when she was younger, finding loud noises, hoovers, um, hand dryers and so on, really alarming. And she's been given a diagnosis of dyslexia. And we're interested in a, in a really kind of broad set of questions um, about children who struggle in these ways. Same or different cognitive and brain mechanisms. So for example, Billy and Freddie both describe having difficulties in paying attention. Does that have the same underlying kind of causal contributions or are they really just two separate things? one or many causes. So for example, Eva has difficulties with reading. She's also got difficulties with language and speech and anxiety. 
do those things all come from the same underlying cause that gives rise to these three different experiences? Or is it three relatively independent things going on that happen to just combine with Eva? And thirdly, is the diagnosis relevant? So Freddie, for example, has a diagnosis of ADHD, Billy doesn't. Does, does that mean anything in terms of their experience and their difficulties? And, and these questions might seem really kind of foundational and kind of obvious. And you might think, well, surely we've already answered all of those, but we really haven't. And it, there's actually kind of subtly quite difficult questions to address. And one reason is because um, from a research perspective, we tend to, tended to have relied on what's called a case control design. And I include myself very much in that. We've used lots of case control designs. And the logic behind a case control design is that we group everybody who we think is similar or the same. So we assume that our case group is a kind of homogenous group of individuals. And then we make comparisons at a group level between them and what we call controls. And a few of us have started to wonder whether there are some limitations in relying solely on that approach. And so one limitation is that we often exclude children with co-occurring difficulties. So most of these children would never find their way into a case control research study because the, the idea behind it is that the kind of cases are kind of pure, quote unquote. But of course, everybody, well, most people I think will know that the reality is that children who experience difficulties in one domain may often experience them in other domains also. The idea of, 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 of kind of um, everyone being the same in the case group is, is a really is a nonsense. Co-occurring difficulties are more often the rule um, than the exception. We tend to also exclude kids with no formal diagnosis. So Billy, for example, would never make it into a study. Um, and that means that there's a large population of kids out there that we don't really know that much about. And thirdly, we don't compare children with different profiles or different experiences. So, so for example, these three individuals probably wouldn't end up being in the same study, so you couldn't draw formal comparisons between them. And the end result is that we can sometimes end up trying to see what predicts diagnostic status rather than trying to explore the mechanisms at play in this large mixed population of individuals who experience neurodevelopmental difficulties. Um, and whether we intended it or not, the kind of diagnostic framework we've been using has come to has come to kind of influence everything from the way that we recruit individuals to the design of the study, to the theories we create, and to the interventions we deliver. And some people have started to wonder whether there's also something to be learned by taking a step back from that framework and thinking transdiagnostically, where we relax the boundaries between supposedly different categories. Um, and that is an approach that we've been trying to take. And so a few years ago, um, a, a large number of people who will all be thanked later on, um, established a, a center called the Center for Attention, Learning and Memory. And the idea would be, that it would be a study of children who experienced neurodevelopmental difficulties, but from a different perspective and not from a kind of case control design. So the idea is that it would be a cohort of children at what we call neurodevelopmental risk. And that's because they've been identified by practitioners and they can have single, multiple or no diagnoses. So it's intentionally a kind of all comers study. And to make that happen, we had to set up some really close working relationships with local um, specialists in speech and language therapy, special educational needs coordinators, pediatricians, specialist teachers, ADHD nurses, ed psychs, clin psychs, occupational therapists, you name it. If, if this person were to come into contact on a daily basis with young people that we thought would be experiencing neurodevelopmental difficulties, then we wanted them to help us with the study and to refer children to us. And so we told them that to identify children that they thought were struggling in the areas of attention, learning and memory. So intentionally kind of generic. Um, and so they would identify individuals and they would then refer them to us. We would invite the family to visit us in Cambridge. Um, and I'll tell you a moment what, what, what a visit would look like. When we started out, we did not think that many people would be interested in taking part in this kind of weird study design. But once we got going and word got out, we were inundated. So we recruited um, over 570 young people from um, special educational services, over 300 from child and adolescent mental health services and pediatrics, and 38 direct from speech and language therapy. So they would all visit us, um, usually for a day, and I'll, I'll explain what we did when they came. 
And along the way, hopefully we had a bit of fun as well. So the, these are some of the families at one of our family fun days. Okay, <clears throat> so we tried to collect as much kind of uh, as broad a data set as we could. So um, young people were only too happy to spit in a pot for us to provide a DNA sample. They were also invited to go through brain scanner, which very many of them did. So we got some images of brain structure and some recordings of brain function. We spent three or four hours taking them through lots of different cognitive assessments, assessing areas of cognition that we thought might be really relevant for learning. Whilst the parents were captive for the day, we got them to fill out lots of questionnaires about what um, the behavior of the child was like at school and at home. We got measures of learning of, of our own, for literacy and numeracy and spelling. And then we also included a, a kind of a simple kind of mental health assessment, assessing things like anxiety and depression. And that was possible in essence, because we pulled capacity across five different research groups and we've got some really nice facilities for families to visit. So this isn't the kind of study that you'd be able to do, I don't think, as a lab working on your own. So shifting to this kind of, kind of broad assessment and large sample size really requires a, a different kind of model for how you do research. It's gonna be a lot more collaborative. And you can use the data set to answer so many things. And there's already about 60 different research projects going on using the data set. Um, and later in the year, they'll become openly available and anyone can access the data to run their research study. And I'm just gonna tell you about kind of one particular set of analyses that we ran and it's to address this question. So what is the nature of the cognitive profiles in this novel sample of children in this kind of novel all comers sample what's the nature of their cognitive profiles and secondly how well did those profiles map onto the formal diagnoses that the children have been given okay and to do that i need to introduce you to something that sounds scary but is actually super simple which is unsupervised machine learning and in particular a type of machine learning called an artificial neural network so Machine learning sounds really fancy. I'm sure you've all heard of it, but it, at its heart, it's really super simple. So to give you an example, every time you go online and you type something into a um, search window, behind the scenes, there is a little unsupervised machine learning algorithm. And what you might not realize you're doing is you're feeding it information about yourself and about your preferences, things that you're searching for. And what it does is build a model of you and your preferences. And then it uses that model to choose products and all sorts of things that it thinks that you might be interested in. So you might notice in the in the you know the advert sides of your browser, you might start to see adverts for things that you might be interested in. And so that's a very simple example of machine learning. And we were going to we use something relatively um, similar. Just turn that notification off. Um, something relatively similar, but instead of obviously feeding it information about searches, we wanted to feed it information about um, the, the um, individuals that we'd recruited. Okay, so to explain machine learning, I'm gonna do it with these fruit. So you've all experienced fruit before we got lemons, melons, oranges, and so on. And let's imagine for a moment that we can describe each one as three values. Perhaps maybe the size of the fruit, the acidity of the fruit and how many seeds it has. Okay, so every fruit we can describe in these three parameters. We then start off with a really simple network. It's just got three nodes in it. And each node is also described by three parameters. We call them weights, but really they're exactly the same as these values. They correspond to size, acidity, and how many seeds it has. And so what we're gonna do is we're going to train these nodes to represent all of these different fruits. So let's take the first one. So we start with the lemon and we start by finding which of these three nodes has a set of weights that are most similar to this item's three values. So let's say maybe this one does. So we allocate this lemon to this node here and then we update these weights so that they become gradually more like the lemon that's just been added in. We then take the melon, we find its best matching node in the network, we allocate it, we update the weights. Next piece, we find its best matching node, we allocate it, we update the weights, and we keep going until we fed everything in. And the idea is over time, 
the network learns which fruits go together because they're really similar to each other. And it also trains the weights of these nodes to sort of optimally represent this data set. So for example, maybe after the first round of training, it's learned that there are these little things with lots and lots of seeds that aren't very acidic. And you know we might call them berries, but they've got very similar properties. It's learned over here, there's these big watery things with lots of seeds. And then down here, it's learned there's these sort of citrusy type things. Now, what you can see is this node down here is kind of making a bit of a mistake. So it's learned about the citruses, but it can't distinguish them from the apples and the pears. And so on the next round of training, this, this network has a quite neat property, which is that it can grow. And so it might grow itself an extra node so that this time around, it can learn the difference between the lemons, the citrusy things, and the kind of apples, pears, guavas. Okay, so that's the idea. So essentially what we're doing is we're taking a, a kind of mixed complex data set and we're training the network to represent it as a kind of simple map, right, of these nodes. Another neat property of the network that we've chosen is that it can actually spawn its own little sub network. So for example, if it learns that there's a, a really mixed and noisy category, maybe the berries, then it can learn that to optimally represent them, it needs to produce its own little sub network to capture all of the differences that exist. And you might be sat there thinking, well, this, that all sounds jolly, but this is a very sort of strange thing to do with data. And you'd be right, but this is why we did it. Well, the first thing is that we might learn something. So we've recruited this really novel and interesting sample. And the whole idea of this exploratory approach is to try and learn about the underlying structure of the data set, you know, who is in it, basically. And the whole idea behind this kind of neural network is that it grows and changes to optimally represent the data set. So we might learn something new. Secondly, it can identify hierarchical relationships. So for example, it might learn that there's a particular category and then there are various different subcategories that are, are more closely related to each other than, um, than other things. And there are lots of theories in neurodevelopment that may make us think that you would expect to find hierarchies like this. For example, it might be kind of ADHD and then you might have subtypes of ADHD. And thirdly, it can create a model. And as we'll see, as the talk unfolds, a model can be a really powerful way of making predictions. Okay, so of course we didn't use fruit. Um, we used data from young people that were part of our study. So we, you know, we don't know about juiciness and acidity and size and so on, but we do know about their memory skills, their vocabulary skills, their listening skills, their attention skills all that rich cognitive data that we collected. And so the idea is that we're gonna pour that data into the neural network and, it, and get it to learn about it. We also included a group of um, children who went to the same schools. So they lived in the same locations um, as the kids who were referred to CALM. Um, and we recruited, we put them through the same cognitive battery. And so we've got this essentially the same data set on those children. And we put all the data in together because we really wanted to try and map out the full spread of profiles that you would expect to find um, out there in the real world. Okay, so what did we find? Well, one possibility is that we find something that you might expect, which is that we know there are different kind of categories within the data, and it might be that the network learns to distinguish these different groups of individuals, or it could be that the network learns something unexpected. So there are many ways to show you what the network has learned. And this is just my favorite way. I find it really intuitive. And I will try and explain it to you now. So what I'm showing you is the, the nodes of the network from above. So we're looking down on the network. And first it grew these big blue nodes. So you can see that they're sort of equidistant in the map. It then grew these little yellow ones sort of add more granularity, more explanation. And then in some cases it grew these little red ones at the, at the bottom. And essentially what it's trying to do is it, it, it's trying to kind of spread its nodes out to optimally fill the space. So let's imagine that there's a kind of multi-dimensional cognitive space 
that describes all the cognitive profiles that we have managed to recruit in, this, in the sample. And what it's trying to do is it's trying to spread its nodes out so that it fills that space in an optimal way. And we can now explore what it's learned to tell us something about that space. So for example, individuals who tend to um, be up here, the, these are their best matching units of nodes in the network. They tend to have really good cognitive performance, often more than the standard deviation above what you would expect for their age. So they're really high performers. And in, in fact, many of the kids who were referred to the CARM as um, the CARM study as struggling have really excellent cognitive performance. And as you move from left to right, we've encountered two groups here who have what we call age appropriate performance. So they perform pretty much exactly what you would expect for a child of their age. And they are slightly better at verbal tasks or slightly better at spatial tasks, but they're exactly really about where you would expect for their age. And ultimately, about 25% of all of the children who were referred to karma struggling fall within these groups. So as far as we can tell, their cognition is absolutely where you would expect. But as we move from left to right, it really fans out. And there are these two kind of clusters or groups. One is here. So these individuals really find things like spatial working memory, spatial short-term memory, attentional control, matrix reasoning, they find those tasks really difficult. So you might call them executive function tasks or maybe spatial cognition tasks. But there seems to be a group of individuals who find those things really tricky. Down here, we find a group of individuals who struggle with things like phonological awareness. So they struggle to decode sounds, um, speech-like sounds. They struggle with things like forwards digit span and backwards digit span, vocabulary. Their parents are also much more likely to report them as struggling with structural elements of language. So we've labeled them as having kind of more verbal cognition difficulties because that kind of characterizes all those tasks. And then right down on the far right, you find a group of individuals who really struggle across the board. And so they have usually difficulties of about one and a half standard deviation, deviations um, below age expected levels. And so what we've done is sort of, sort of map out the cognitive profiles that that characterize the whole sample. And I should say that all of these individuals are in mainstream education. Um, so they're all um, in mainstream ed. Um, and what you soon realize, of course, is that there's just massive amounts of variability. So one option is that the, is that the network has learned about a child's diagnosis. And so the, I'm showing you here the network from above. And if I plot now the locations of individuals who have an ADHD diagnosis, if having an ADHD diagnosis told us about the kind of cognitive profile that you're likely to have, then we would expect those individuals to be roughly grouped within the network. So for example, let's say kids with an ADHD diagnosis all experience um, executive function difficulties, then you might expect them to sit up here. And of course you can immediately see that that's nonsense. They can be found pretty much anywhere from really exceptional cognitive performance, struggling with lots of different things, more specific profiles. Having a diagnosis of ADHD doesn't really predict where you sit within the network. And that's actually true for all of the other diagnostic information that we had about the individuals, which led us to a fairly kind of straightforward conclusion, which is simply that diagnosis is itself not a good predictor of a child's cognitive profile. And that's presumably because there's such amount of variability within individuals with the same diagnosis um, and that's why that's not what the that's not what the network lands. And if you're interested in, in, in that debate and that discussion, and this is one that we've had a lot. So there are lots of other papers from the group. I can share the links in the chat later. Um, exploring this idea. So, well, maybe the network has learned something important about children's literacy and numeracy skills. So we also know about how good they are at things like maths and reading. And we haven't told the network anything about that. So we'll see how well it can predict it. And we did that using something called holdout cross-validation, which I will explain now. So let's imagine that we take 80% of our sample and we use it to train up the cognitive space um, that I described earlier. So this cognitive space now comes to represent the 80%. I then take the 20% of the sample that we held out, and I take the first individual in that 
and I find their best matching node in the network, there it is. And then I use the individuals who made that node in the training process to make a prediction about this child's literacy and numeracy, because I know what the literacy and numeracy score actually is, so I can see how good my prediction is. And I compare that prediction to if I just to choose a node at chance and make the prediction from that. I take the next person, find their best matching node, make the prediction about their literacy and numeracy scores, compare it to a node taken at chance. And we repeat that process until everybody has appeared in the held out sample. And what we can then do is compare these two distributions, the actual prediction that I made using the real data versus the chance distribution that I made by essentially choosing nodes at, at, at random. And what you can see is that one is better than the other. So we're more accurate with the prediction than chance. And the Cohen's D, the effect size is about 0.47, well, getting on for 0.5, which if, you, if you're into your statistics, you'll know that that is a sort of a decent kind of medium effect size. So the cognitive network makes pretty good predictions about a child's literacy and numeracy with a medium effect size. Okay, so as you know, we know a lot about these individuals. We've got all of that data that I showed you, all the different types of data. One type of data that we've got are brain scans. So a particular type of brain scan that we have is called a T1 weighted image. image. I was looking at the captions. So when I say T1, it spells T as in the drink T, but it's the letter T. So we can use that to, to image the outer six millimeters of the cortex, um, outer six millimeters of the brain, which is called the cortex. And there are lots of different ways that we can do it, but what we essentially did is, is identify different characteristics of the gray matter in these different colored in areas. If you're interested in, in how or why we chose these areas, then do ask at the end, but I'm not gonna cover it now. And essentially what we wanted to know is if we knew the characteristics of gray matter over these different brain areas, could we use that to make a prediction about where they sit in this cognitive map? So maybe if we knew your kind of brain profile, it would make a really good prediction of your cognitive profile. Or maybe one particular brain profile could sit in a couple of different locations in the cognitive space. Or maybe knowing your brain profile makes a really poor quality prediction about where you sit in cognitive space. In essence, does a child's location in brain space make a good prediction of their location in cognitive space? And we tested this using the same cross-validation procedure that I showed you, the 80-20, 80-20. I won't go through it all again. I'll just cut to the chase. And what you find is that you can predict it. Your prediction is better than chance, but you'll see that the Cohen's D is now much smaller, just 0.15, it's a really small effect size. Now we've got hundreds and hundreds of kids, so it's still significant. But what it tells us is, that whilst a child's brain profile can make a prediction about their cognitive profile, the effect size is really small. Okay, so let's have a, a little summary. So what we did is recruit this large sample of individuals that have kind of come to the attention of multiple different practitioners. And then we fed the cognitive data into this simple machine learning tool called an artificial neural network. And it created a model of the cognitive skills and we can then explore that model to try and understand this sort of transdiagnostic cognitive space that characterizes this big mixed sample. First thing we learned really is that the model does not correspond well to a child's formal diagnosis. So the label doesn't tell you where you sit in the network. It does make pretty good predictions about learning skills, literacy and numeracy with a medium effect size. Local differences in brain structure make a really poor prediction about someone's location in that space. So that's what we've that's what we've learned so far. And that sort of that poor performance um, from the using brain data to predict the cognitive profiles really got us thinking about whether we were thinking about the brain in the right way. So let's think of other complex systems. So on the screen at the minute, you'll be seeing a tube network. So this is the London tube. And let's imagine one day you're making a journey and Russell Square is closed. Now, that probably won't really affect you badly unless you're unfortunate enough to need to get to Russell Square. And that's because Russell Square is not a particularly important node within the network. However, if one day you're making a journey and King's Cross St Pancras was closed, 
then you would really notice that. And why is that? It's because King's Cross and Pancreas is what we call a hub in this network. And that's because so many other connections run through it. And if you were to have problems at King's Cross and Pancreas, then they may well cascade across the network. And it turns out that all sorts of complex systems have this kind of organization, this kind of hubs and then peripheral nodes. So in the tube, places like Paddington, King's Cross, Liverpool Street, these are hubs. You get hubs in social networks as well, for example, um, and you get hubs in the brain. So we can start thinking about how brains are organized on a kind of more global scale by moving away from this idea of, you know, have you got a bit more or less gray matter here or there? And instead thinking about the broader way in which the brain is wired up. And to do that, we can use a different type of scan. So this is a diffusion tensor imaging scan or a DTI scan. This is from one of the um, kids in our sample. This is from a nine-year-old boy. And what it shows are essentially the main fiber pathways in the brain. So for example, um, you can see the optic nerves coming from the eyes, you can see the spinal cord coming down, and you can see all the other thick fibrous connections. And the way that it does this is that it, it tracks the diffusion of water molecules. And so if you imagine you had a pipe and there was water diffusing along it, it would diffuse along the pipe much more easily than it would diffuse through the wall of the pipe. And so we can track the diffusion of water to infer the presence of these different kind of tubules in people's brains. And then we can use these um, kind of connective uh, fibers to create maps like this. So this is called a connectome. Each of these um, spheres, these circles, corresponds to a different location in the brain. And then these tubes or these lines connecting them correspond to fibers that connect these two areas. And it turns out that in, in our sample, there are hubs. So these areas that I've colored in are locations in the brain, in, in our sample, that tend to be much more strongly connected than you would expect by chance. So there are hubs in the brains of the, of the sample that we collected. So we wondered whether these hubs might play a different role in, in different children's brains. And there, there's lots of ways of showing that. And I'm just gonna show you one way because I think it's, it's what makes best sense to me. So we identified the hubs, like I told you, and then we calculated the overall efficiency of someone's brain network. And efficiency is just how easy is it to go from any one location to any other location? Like how easy to get from one tube stop to another tube stop? And then what we did is we would remove from our model um, each hub in turn. And we would see how big an impact does that taking a hub out, basically kind of closing a tube station, have on the overall efficiency of the network. And what you can see is that as you remove the hubs, the overall efficiency drops. But it starts to fan out according to um, the group that the child is in. And these colored lines correspond to the initial groups that I told you about a few moments ago. So individuals over here who tend to find cognitive tasks really, really easy. Those individuals tend to find that their, their brains are most critically organized around hubs. And we can tell that because as we disconnect the hubs, so their, um, as we disconnect the hubs, so the efficiency of the networks drops most proportionally. And if we move from left to right, all the way up here, this light blue arrow, you find that these individuals their brains are least critically organized around hubs. And we know that because as you gradually remove those hubs, the efficiency of their brains drops the least. You almost nearly then met the dogs that we are dog sitting, um, but they've gone away. Um, so basically what we found is that as you, as you disconnect the hubs, everyone's efficiency drops, but these differences between how much they drop reveal that some bre people's brains are much more heavily organized around hubs than others. There we go. Okay, so just to give you a quick summary. So the brain is a complex interconnected system that we can study through something called connectomics. And we can use a second type of network to model that kind of integrated system um, using diffusion imaging. So the diffusion of water molecules to track pathways in the brain. And the more critically a child's brain is organized around hubs, 
the easier they find our cognitive tasks. And children who rely less on hubs um, for their brain's organization tend to find the cognitive tasks we used more difficult. And the overall effect size of that, I can tell you, is pretty large. So, stories so far. So we started by recruiting this large mixed um, heterogeneous population of young people who experienced neuro neurodevelopmental difficulties of different types. You met three of them. We then used cognitive data to create this kind of transdiagnostic cognitive map that describes the different ways in which individuals um, differ. We then tested, does this correspond to diagnosis? Does it predict literacy and numeracy? doesn't really correspond to diagnosis, but it does make a really good prediction of literacy and numeracy, or a pretty good prediction. Then we tested whether local differences in gray matter would predict where you sit in this space. And they do, but only by a tiny amount. So not particularly impressive. And then next we created these whole brain connectomes for each individual in the sample. And we asked whether the more global properties of how these are organized predict where these individuals sit within the space. And that does a much, much better job. So that's how, we, that's how far we've got so far. But it kind of leaves the obvious question, which is why? So how do these differences in brain organization emerge in the first place? And that's the, the bit that I'm gonna focus on in the last five minutes of the talk. So let's imagine for a minute that we were able to simulate the growth of different people's brains. So using some simple mathematical rules, we were able to simulate the growth of different brains. And because we were specifying the kind of mathematical rules behind the simulation, we could adjust the simulation in, in lots of different systematic ways in order to see how close we can get to simulating the real development of someone's brain. And what we could then explore is whether there are particular key differences in that simulation that seem to give rise to the differences that we observe in the sample that we've collected. And that's what we've been trying to do using a third type of network called a generative network. Um, now, for those of you who don't like maths, there is a tiny bit of maths coming, but do not panic because it is not critical or essential for understanding the basic principle of, of how this works. So let's imagine for a moment that we've got two bits of brain or two locations in the brain, brain area I and brain area J. And over development, these two brain areas might well connect with each other. And we can express the probability of them connecting as a trade-off between two other parameters. And it's a trade-off between a parameter here that I've called costs, and that's simply how close or far are the two brain areas. So for example, if two brain areas are really close to each other, then it's low cost, it's easy to connect. If they're far away from each other, then it's a relatively high cost connection. And we trade that off against what I've called here value. Now, value could be anything about I and J that's, that's not to do with where they're located in the brain. So it's not spatial or geometric. So I'll give you one particular example that I'm gonna keep using again and again. So the example is matching neighborhoods. So let's say for argument's sake that brain areas I and J already share lots of neighbors in common. So they themselves are already connected to lots of other brain areas and they're connected to the same brain areas as each other. That will mean that it's a relatively high value connection. So even if the cost is high, if they're a long way away from each other, they may well wire together. And so over time, the probability of them connecting is a trade-off between these two things. I mean, we've got these two little terms, these little squiggly lines, and these are just modifiers. They mean that for each individual, we can say that cost is a bit more important or that values is a bit more important. For those of you who like your maths, this is um, called eta and this is called gamma. And, and they're just the ways that we modify the overall contribution of costs or we modify the overall contribution of values. If you're not a fan of the maths, then it's, it's still really straightforward. So the chances of these two brain areas connecting over the course of development can be expressed as a trade-off between how close they are to each other, so the distance, against how closely matching their neighborhoods are, so whether they're connected to similar nodes as each other. And for each individual, we can use this simple rule to simulate the growth of their brain over time. And for one individual, 
distance might be more important than the neighborhoods for someone else the neighborhoods might be more important than the distance so we can we can adjust these two kind of parameters that are governing the trade-off um, in, in tiny amounts in order to see how well it, we're able to predict the simulation of, of someone's brain okay so let's step back from brains for a moment and think about a different type of network so these are all cartoon characters that you might recognize. <clears throat> and some of them are friends already. So you can see these blue lines correspond to who is already a friend in this social network. And we need to try and predict where will the next friendship take place? So let's get our rule up. Let's say for argument's sake, in this particular instance, we've, we've biased it towards the distance penalty relative to the neighborhoods. And so with this rule, the next connection will probably be between these two individuals, because even though they've got no neighbors in common, they're really close to each other. And we've said that the most important thing is to save the cost. Same network again, different rule. So this time we've downplayed distance, but we've played up the matching neighborhoods rule, right? So this time around, the next connection to form or the next friendship to form the network should be between these two individuals. Why is that? Well, it's because even though they're a long way away from each other, even though they're a long way away from each other, they already share one, two, three neighbors in common. So you can hopefully see pretty quickly that calibrating the trade-off between costs and values will change the organization of the network as it grows. So coming back to brains for a minute, let's imagine early on in brain development, no two is about to make a connection. And because there are not many connections elsewhere in the network yet, it primarily will connect with something that's really close by, so no 36. However, as development proceeds, and there's lots more connections in the network, what we say these, we, in the business, we say that this, these now have topological information. And what you can find now is that even though node 27 is really close, node 59 has lots of neighbors that match with node two and node 59. And so this long range connection can now be made. So over time, the network gradually shifts from just being constrained by growing by costs. And then once the connections form, the actual distribution of those connections themselves starts to drive the future connections. And so, why is that important? Well, let's look at the, the wiring probabilities before that connection goes in. You can see them here. So the hot colors are the ones that are most likely to connect with each other. And then a single connection goes in and you can see that as soon as that single connection goes in, suddenly new connections become more likely. So the insertion of a single connection suddenly makes a whole new set of connections plausible. So we use this rule to try and simulate lots of different brains of individuals and see how close we get to the real thing. And you can compare them using what's called an energy function. So if, if, if the simulation is a lot like the real thing, then it's said to have low energy. And what you find is that this matching neighborhood rule, which is number one here, produces the best or the most plausible networks relative to all sorts of other rules that I didn't tell you about for, for time. And it tells us that these produce the most plausible brains or the brain simulations and if you focus in on the parameters that it takes to produce a really plausible brain, so that this is the variability in the neighborhood parameter and the variability in the distance parameter, you see that the really plausible networks all come from this tiny, tiny sliver. What does that tell us? It tells us that even though everyone's brain is really different, that the, the parameters that govern the growth of our brain networks are really tightly controlled. And if we zoom in on that even more closely, each of these little crosses corresponds to an individual child within the CALM sample, telling us that it's the tiny amounts of variation are needed in order to produce the diversity of the connectomas that we see across development. And, and how can small amounts of information, small amounts of, of change pr produce these really diverse connectomas? Is this idea that even adding in single connections can suddenly steer a network down a different path and the end result years later is a, is a differently organized brain. So simple math rules when played out over development can result in really different brain organizations. Yeah, which is exactly what that says. Okay, I'm gonna skip this bit because you don't need to know it and just finish up here. So K 
can we simulate the growth of children with brain networks and thereby understand the principles of their development? We think we can. And at the heart of this is a wiring equation that trades off costs or distance against values and neighborhood matching. And tiny amounts of variation, oh, that disappears so quickly. Tiny amounts of this variation trade off in this trade off are needed to simulate each child's brain network. And I will just finish with this recap so far. So we've recruited this kind of broad, diverse sample of young people. Then we've learned about their profiles using this simple neural network. We've shown that where you sit in that network is somehow associated with some broad organizational principles of your brain. And we've then explored whether we can simulate those differences using simple mathematical rules. And it turns out that there's some really tightly controlled parameters, variability in which produces those differences. And if you're interested in why, well, you'll have to ask me at the end. Um, and so, for instance, we're interested in how genetics may well play a role um, or experiences might play a role in adjusting these parameters and thus steering people's brain networks down different trajectories. I will skip that for now. If you're interested in finding out more about our lab, then please do head over to our website. Big thanks to the Medical Research Council who funded our work and to um, our other funders. This is the lab. Special thanks to Roma and Dan, who did a lot of the analysis that you've seen. The CALM team, especially thanks to Sue and Joni, who helped, who led this project really, and, and this massive group of individuals who helped collect this incredible data set. Collaborators who helped with the analysis, particularly Petra, Ed, and Joe, and the biggest thank you of all really to our participants and their families for all the time that they've given um, and that we're still, we are still running the study. So they're all coming back for a second visit, which is on there at the minute. And, um, and that is that. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Duncan. And uh, that was an absolutely fascinating talk. And I think uh, really interesting to see some quite complicated ideas presented, broken down into their constituent parts and presented really clearly. So we've already had some, some really good questions come in. So for anyone who's interested in asking a question to Duncan, please write them into the question and answer function uh, on the webinar. So you'll see a Q&A button down the bottom. If you type them in there, we'll try and get to them. We might not be able to get to all of the questions, but we'll do our best. So um, I, I'll jump in with the first question, which uh, is a question that was posed by Susie, um, asking if, if you have any data on the access to formal support that the children were having. And the reason for this question is because uh, Susie is interested in whether it might predict or account for variability in the diagnoses people receive or don't receive. Um, and particularly because there's some interesting research about whether the type of professional somebody first sees predicts the type of diagnosis that they get. Uh, but that data came from uh, artificially created vignettes rather than real world data. So she's interested in whether that plays out in your real world data in this, in this sample. That's a great question. And it does indeed play out. So if you've come from an educational route, broadly speaking, usually a SENCO, a special educational needs coordinator. So that's the biggest group of individuals who will come without a diagnosis, without a formal diagnosis of any kind. Whereas if you were to come from CAMS, then it's much more likely that you have been given a diagnosis already. So that's one broad way of showing that the kind of referral route that you get, which I guess is the best way we have at getting at what kind of what kind of support route has, has the family gone down um, to, tends, to, to, tends to influence whether or not um, the individual has a diagnosis or not. All right, brilliant, thanks for that. Um, a follow on question from that was whether the data set, the um, PAM data set that you referred to throughout the talk is something that is public or available for analysis by other researchers. Good question. So at the minute it is available, but you'll have to, but it has to be done in collaboration with the original research team. And that is because back in 2013, when all the consents and stuff were uh, agreed with ethics, there was a clause in the ethics statement saying that the data can only be shared within the research team. So of course, in the intervening seven or eight years since the study first got its approval, attitudes and approaches to data sharing have changed dramatically, thankfully. And we've just been given new approval to set it up as a managed access database. And so once we've finished data collection for time two, which is currently ongoing, we will make the whole thing available as a managed access database, at which point there'll be a relatively kind of light touch 
kind of online form people to fill in to describe what data they're after, what they're going to do with it. Um, and then there will hopefully be a smooth process by which those can be approved and the data be released. Um, so that's, that's, yeah, so that's where we're up to with data sharing. Okay, brilliant. So in the interim, get in touch with the team. Yeah, in the interim, in get touch. in touch with us. Yeah, exactly. Perfect. All right. Thanks for that. Um, another question, which I guess follows on from the first, is whether you have any information collected that accounted for the lack of formal diagnosis for those who didn't have a diagnosis. Um, were there particular groups, for example, that were more likely not to have a diagnosis given the pattern of difficulties that they had? So was it, for example, more likely that girls didn't receive a diagnosis over boys or, or any patterns like that? Really interesting question. So one group of individuals who tend not to receive diagnoses in our experience are individuals with language disorders, so DLD. They, so that's why I've always kind of classed them as being seen by the speech and language therapist, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they've been given a formal diagnosis by anyone. And so I think that those difficulties often don't receive diagnosis, at least in Cambridge, so where the majority of our sample is. Um, two thirds of the sample are boys, and there are interesting differences between the boys that are referred and the girls that are referred. And so the boys that are referred tend to have more sort of externalizing um, difficulties so a more kind of ADHD-like profile. And we suspect that one reason why they've been referred is because people are very much aware of um, kind of difficulties in social situations in class and so on. The girls that are referred tend not to have those difficulties, but their cognitive difficulties tend to be, tend to be, tend to be bigger. And we suspect that that's because in order, for, in order for a girl to receive the same degree of support, the difficulties need to be bigger um, and so that was something that we discovered quite early on and we're quite surprised by is that we expected to see more boys than girls but we hadn't expected to see the systematic difference between the referrals for girls and the referrals for boys that's really interesting and i think that's something that we see in autism specifically so it's interesting to hear that actually that pattern seems to be the case across a range of neurodevelopmental conditions that actually the level of difficulties girls need to have in order to be seen by professionals is generally a bit higher. Um, so the next question is from Teresa Tavasoli, who said, thank you for a fascinating talk. Um, if children find cognitive tasks easier when their brain is organized around hubs, the question is how could the development of hubs be supported during learning or other activities? Or do we yet know how we support the development of hubs? I don't yet know the answer to that question is the simple answer, but we are currently running a study where we've collected lots of environmental, it's sort of a parallel study to calm, but we've tried to get as diverse a range of socioeconomic and kind of social backgrounds as we can. And our idea was to try and take a similar approach as I've taken here with calm, but this time to explore whether there are characteristics in someone's environment that seem to be associated with sort of different developmental trajectories. And if that study works, then it might give us some clues as to what particular experiences seem to be important. There's one general kind of theory in the literature, which is that early life adversity of varying types can, can kind of adjust the overall time frame of cognitive and brain development, such that if you experience a lot of early life adversity, it kind of compresses brain development early on in that you basically have to develop much more quickly than your peers and that that can have some long-term knock-on consequences whereas individuals who live in very enriched environments can have this sort of slower kind of more more gentle process of cognitive and brain development and which might have longer term benefits so that's one kind of very generic broad theory that we are really interested in testing with some of the modeling that i introduced so the idea of are the trajectories of, of brain development subtly different kind of shifted forwards and backwards in time depending upon what early life experiences that people have. And I guess the, the outcomes of that will probably be the closest thing I have to an answer to that question. Okay, yeah, really interesting. I guess more, more study needed essentially is, is the, the answer there. So the next question uh, comes from Char Charlotte Huggins, who's asked if you have any thoughts about the implications for this work on how we define and structure diagnostic categories in the first place. Um, do you think we need to change how we approach them if they're not predictive of the needs people have, or do they still serve a useful purpose? That is like a million dollar question. It's a question that um, we ask ourselves a lot. 
So people sometimes think that what we're saying by taking a transdiagnostic approach is that we think that diagnosis isn't important, which isn't true at all. Um, it's a kind of really crucial moment of professional recognition for a family that have probably been working towards it for many years. And also in the current system with the way that resources are currently configured is it's usually the, the moment where more resources be, should become available to that family. And so in that sense, it's a really crucial moment. I guess our question is what happens next after that moment? And is that diagnostic information sufficient to provide anyone who has to try and support that young person with the right information that they need? And I think that our suggestion is that probably not at least not on its own. Um, and there's a lot of other information that would be worth having. And I think there are also some other potential benefits of, of, a, uh, of a sort of trans diagnostic way of thinking. So one is, for instance, to have a really child focused way of assessing individuals. So for instance, if I'm assessing a child and I have a potential diagnosis in mind, I will try and tailor my assessments to confirm or not confirm that particular diagnosis, which means that I might miss all sorts of other relevant areas because they don't fall within the kind of diagnostic criteria and so they're not relevant. But of course, to that child and that family and, that exper and the experience that they're about, they're gonna have in the next coming years, that information will be super relevant. So I think one benefit of a transdiagnostic approach is that hopefully it might steer us to more of a kind of child-centered way of assessing. Um, and secondly, it could be a really, Good way of sort of empowering teachers if we ex, you know if we can find ways of kind of characterizing in straightforward and usable ways the, the different ways in which individuals might struggle sort of regardless of the diagnosis they have and and start to thinking about targeting or generating interventions that are addressing those particular areas of difficulty so yeah there's a few ways that i think that it could be useful um, as, as, a, as a sort of next step after diagnosis for thinking about how do we provide the right information for that person to get good support. Brilliant, thanks for that. The next question was submitted uh, anonymously and the question was about whether measuring strengths that are typical in people who are neurodivergent or have neurodevelopmental conditions would change some of potentially the, the implications of this research. So for example, people who might typically fall under the autism diagnostic category might have strong attention to detail or a strong sense of justice. Are there certain things, did, did you first of all measure some things that were considered strengths or were most of the things that were measured in this study, things that uh, tend to be challenges? And if you did add those, do you think that they would extend our learning and, and what we might be able to take from a study like this one? Brilliant question. Again, that was a question that we ask ourselves a lot. So first thing to say is that m many of the children that we saw, even though they'd been referred as kind of quote unquote struggling, their cognitive skills were really good or in some cases exceptional. So we did find lots of individuals, for example, who could absolutely ace a spatial working memory assessment or a you know, fluid reasoning assessment um, or a vocabulary assessment. We found lots of, yeah, so it was not at all the case that you know everyone struggles with the tasks we used. Big limitation of the whole thing is it's really reliant on us having good, valid, reliable, standardized measures of things. And that has constrained heavily the kinds of tasks that are included. And so, for example, there are very few tasks that focus on things like social processing. Like we've got lots of questionnaire data about that kind of stuff. We've got very few sort of tasks that, that are about social processing. We have very few um, tasks about um, potential areas of strength for autistic people, for example. And I think that we would be more able to include them if we could find really robust and valid assessments of them. And the reason why that's important is because as soon as you introduce those data into that kind of neural network, the first thing it will learn is about the kind of low level psychometric properties of the tasks. And that's why you've got to be super careful as to what you put in, otherwise it can just recapitulate all sorts of biases. You know, it, the idea that machine learning's objective is a real nonsense because it can just recapitulate the biases of whatever you put in. And the current big challenge for the field is that, is that the assessments for, um, the assessments for kind of the kind of classic areas of cognition are all sort of standardized, validated, shown to be reliable. And so that's what gets used. But what we also need are some, 
equally good assessments of other areas. Um, and that's what we're currently lacking. And so that's why it's currently limited in the way that it is. Fantastic. Thanks. We have so many questions coming in. So I'm really sorry to everyone that we don't get to, but I will pose one or two more questions before we finish up. So another one that's come in is about whether there's anything from the studies that you presented that tell us anything about whether the socioeconomic situation of the children involved has any uh, consideration in these models or whether it's, it's a useful metric to determine any of the outcomes or relationships that you've seen. Yeah, so we're currently doing some work on socioeconomic status at the minute, and we find that it can influence the same mechanisms. One thing we noticed really soon when we started running CALM is that we'd never run a study like that with these sort of, you know, the practitioners referring as families that they had encountered in real life. And we soon realized that it was a much more diverse group of individuals in socioeconomic terms than we would normally get if we just like put some posters up, um, you know, around town. And so we think that we know already that um, socioeconomic adversity can be a, a particular risk factor for certain types of neurodevelopmental difficulty um, that likely overlap with those that we've captured in the CALM sample. Um, and in other studies, we found that kind of standard measures of, of socioeconomic status aren't wildly good things like you know, parental income, parental occupation, and so on. But what does seem to be really important are um, things like, um, like books in the home, how often do you sit and go through a book with a child? Those kind of, I guess we call kind of softer measures of socioeconomic status. Um, and we tend to find that when you put all the measures in, those will always trump the kind of classic, you know, income, occupation kind of measures. Um, and we think that that's not necessarily because there's something particularly important about sitting down with a book, but it's more that it's a, a good way of getting at sort of parental approaches to interacting with their kids. All right, and what, time for one last question then, which comes from uh, Susanna Fantoni. So it says that you mentioned at the start of your talk that you collected genetic information and that the children took part in brain imaging studies. Did you uh, have a look at how physical, genetic, or neurological differences may play a part in explaining these findings? So for example, were you able to see a link between things like autism and epilepsy or other common co-occurring physical health conditions? The answer is that, we, that neurologically, you would you would say that if you looked at these scans, you can't see the difference between them. So, so the scans are all looked through by a radiologist. Um, that's part of our standard procedure in case there's a kind of anomalous um, kind of brain tumor or a cyst or, or or something in there that actually requires medical attention, and so there is an ever so slightly elevated risk of those things in the CALM sample, but it's tiny. It's still like less than 1%. Um, so neurologically, I don't think there is a kind of, you know, kind of, kind of, yeah, underlying neurological explanation that explains things. And essentially we, with the genetics, we, we haven't yet started really exploring the genetics that's kind of next thing on our list. And, and we do have an interest in, in Cambridge looking at the intersection between things like epilepsies and autism. Um, and we've got a whole series of candidate genes that we want to explore that in, involved um, in both of those. So that is one area that we're going to look at next, but we haven't done it yet. All right, brilliant. Well, that just leaves me to say thank you very much for kicking off our Autistica Festival with this really fascinating talk. It's been really, really interesting to me. And I'm sure, uh, as I can see from the number of comments and questions that are coming in, everyone else has found it really interesting too. So um, please do join us for the rest of the sessions of the festival this week. If you haven't already, please sign up for the individual sessions that you're planning on attending. And uh, we'll hopefully be able to get to some of your questions in the future sessions if we didn't get to them today. But we look forward to having more opportunities to present uh, research and findings to you throughout the week. Thank you, everyone.